Hi guys, here is Dr. Benaduce. In this lecture, we will look at the appendicular skeleton, specifically the upper limbs and the pectoral girdle. We have 126 bones making up the appendicular skeleton. And these bones are divided into two groups. We have the bones that are making up the limbs themselves. So we have the upper limb bones and we have the lower limb bones. And we have the bones that attach the limbs to the axial skeleton. And the bones that attach the upper limb to the axial skeleton are referred as pectoral girdle bones. And the bones that attach the lower limb to the axial skeleton are referred in a group as the pelvic girdle bones. We will start studying the upper limb bones now. The upper limb is divided into three main regions. We have the arm, and then we have the forearm and the hand. When we say arm, guys, we are in an anatomy class. We are referring to the anatomical arm. If you're referring to the entire upper limb, we are saying upper limb, okay? This is specifically the arm. So, the arm has only one bone, which is called humerus. The forearm has two bones, which are named ulna and radius. The hand has eight carpal bones, five metacarpal bones, and 14 phalanges. Now, we will go over the bone features, the details we find in each of these bones in our upper limbs. Our arm has only one bone, and this bone is the humerus. To go over all the different details we find in the humerus bone, I will be using the pictures I'm giving you in the lab terminology list, so you guys can start getting used to all that you need to know for lab and lecture as well. These pictures are showing you the left humerus. This is specifically the anterior aspect of the left humerus, and right here we have the posterior aspect of the left humerus. How do I know this is the posterior view? Because I see in the distal aspect of the humerus this big indentation, which is the part that will receive a specific bone feature of the ulna that we'll be talking soon. So I always know that this big indentation is in the posterior aspect of the humerus. Consequently, I know that this is the posterior aspect of the humerus. Now, when we look at the humerus bone, we can see in the proximal end the head of the humerus. And the head of the humerus is what we articulate with the scapula, which is one of the two bones forming the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle, remember, is a group of bones that will be connecting the upper limb to the axial skeleton. So the head of the humerus is what will be articulating with the glenoid fossa of the scapula specifically. And when this articulation happens, we call that the glenohumeral joint. Now, underneath the head of the humerus, obviously we have a neck. So right here we have the anatomical neck and the anatomical neck. What happens is that the humerus bone has two necks. We have the anatomical neck, which is right underneath the head of the humerus. And we also have another neck right here, which is called surgical neck. And this neck is called surgical because this is the place where usually people fracture the humerus bone. And people end up having surgery. So we have the anatomical neck and then we have the surgical neck. Also, in this proximal part of the humerus, we see two bumps. And these bumps are right here and right here. We can see them very well in the anterior view. But in the posterior view, we just see the big bump. These bumps are points of attachment for muscles. And we have the big bump and the smaller bump. Consequently, they were named the greater tubercle, and this one, the lesser tubercle. When we look in the posterior view, we can only see the greater tubercle facing laterally. The greater tubercle is always lateral, and the lesser tubercle is always anterior, as you can see right here. We can only see it in the anterior aspect of the humerus. If you pay attention, you can see that we have a groove here. And this groove is between the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. How do you think we call a groove between two tubercles? We call it 
intertubercular groove. Inter means between. Now, through this groove, we have a tendon of the biceps brachii muscle passing. And the biceps brachii is a muscle found in the anterior aspect of our arm. And since we have a tendon of the biceps brachii passing between the two tubercles right here, and we know that the biceps brachii is a muscle in the anterior aspect of our arm, we can remember that the lesser tubercle needs to be facing anteriorly. So the tendon of the biceps brachii muscle can pass between the two tubercles. And since passing through this groove, we have a tendon of the biceps brachii muscle. This groove, besides being called intertubercular groove, is also called bicipital groove, making a reference to the biceps brachii muscle. When we go over the different muscles we have in our body, you guys will learn that we have in our shoulder a muscle called deltoid muscle. And this muscle is like this and attaches on the lateral aspect of the humerus bone. And this point of attachment for the deltoid muscle is a rough spot right here in the shaft of the humerus. And a rough spot is called tuberosity. Since this tuberosity serves as an attachment point for the deltoid muscle, this is specifically called deltoid tuberosity. Now I would like you to observe how these structures that we named greater tubercule, lesser tubercule, and head look like. Can you notice that the head of the humerus has a smooth appearance, is rounded? Of course, these will be used in an articulation. It will form specifically the glenohumeral joint. Now, when we look at the greater tubercule, the lesser tubercule, we see that they are not smooth, they are rough. And that is because they are not articulating with another bone. They are there to serve as point of attachment for muscles. When we look in the distal aspect of the humerus bone, can you notice that this part of the humerus is very smooth? And this smooth part, as well as this smooth part in the posterior aspect, will serve as areas of the humerus bone that will be articulating with another bone. We know that in the forearm we have two bones. We have the radius bone and we have the ulna bone. The radius bone is always lateral. The ulna bone is always medial. How do I remember that the radius bone is always lateral? I remember that the thumb is the antenna for the radio. Remember old days we had the radio and the radio had an antenna? So the antenna for the radius bone is your thumb. Consequently, the radius bone is always lateral. Remember the anatomical position, the palms of your hands are facing anteriorly, which puts your thumb in the lateral aspect of your body. So we know that the radius bone is lateral. We know that the head of the humerus needs to be facing medially because it will articulate with the scapula. Consequently, if this is medial, the head is medial, all this aspect of the humerus is medial and all this aspect of the humerus is lateral. As a consequence, this part is closer to the medial aspect of the humerus and this part is closer to the lateral aspect of the humerus. Now we know that in our forearm, the bone located laterally is the radius bone because we have the thumb right there. So this specific part of the humerus bone will be articulating with the radius bone. And this specific part of the humerus bone will be articulating with the ulna bone. You need to know the name of these condyles. Remember, condyles are smooth, rounded surfaces. And the smooth, rounded surface of the humerus bone that articulates with the radius bone is called capitulum. And the smooth, rounded surface of the humerus bone that articulates with the ulna bone is called trochlea.
How do I remember that the radius articulates with the capitulum of the humerus bone? Is by remembering that for the radio to work, it needs to capture the signal to tune in. So I remember that the radius bone articulates with the capitulum of the humerus bone. And by exclusion, the ulna bone will articulate with the trochlea of the humerus bone. Now, as I mentioned, the trochlea as well as the capitulum are smooth, rounded surfaces used in articulation, and as such, they are condyles. They are the condyles of the humerus that have special names, the capitulum and the trochlea, but they are condyles. Now, I'd like you to notice that right here, we have a bump to the side, and we have a bump to the side. Now, these bumps to the side, they are above the condyles right here. And as such, they are called epicondyles. Now, we have the epicondyle on the lateral aspect. This is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And we have the epicondyle in the medial aspect. So, this is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Now, I would like you to go and stay in anatomical position. And then, with one of your hands, you touch your elbow, and then you go medially. Do you feel a bump? Guys, that bump that you're feeling is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Now, try to go and touch the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Can you notice that the medial epicondyle is much bigger than the lateral epicondyle? And you can feel that in your upper limb. So it's very easy to remember that the medial epicondyle is much more pronounced than the lateral epicondyle. And obviously, the medial epicondyle, since it is facing medially, it will be always in the same side as the head of the humerus. Now, in case you only have an image of the distal aspect of the humerus, it will be very easy for you to identify which side of the humerus is lateral or medial. Because when we are looking at the humerus, the big epicondyle is always facing medially. And we can feel it in our upper limb. And the lateral epicondyle, which is small, is always facing laterally. Now, when I'm looking at the humerus bone and I see this depression, I know I'm looking at the posterior aspect of the humerus bone. And do you remember how do we call a depression? It is called a fossa. Now, this fossa of the humerus articulates with the olecranon process of the ulna. And that's why this fossa receives the name of olecranon fossa. Now, if I can identify the olecranon fossa and I can identify the medial epicondyle, I can say if that humerus that I'm looking at is the right or left humerus. Now, let's look at this amazing image and check if we are looking at the right or left humerus bone. We see here an epicondyle. This is much bigger than this. Consequently, this is the medial epicondyle of the humerus. We see here a fossa. Consequently, this is the posterior aspect of the humerus. And then we can identify that this is the right humerus bone. Now, if we look at the bones in the forearm, we see the radius bone, which is always lateral, and we see the ulna bone, which is always medial. Obviously, the ulna bone is in the same side as the medial epicondyle, and the radius bone is in the same side as the lateral epicondyle. This part of the ulna is called olecranon. Oh, I hit my olecranon. Guys, you hit your elbow. The olecranon is the anatomical name for elbow. So this is the olecranon of the ulna. Obviously, the olecranon process of the ulna will articulate with the olecranon fossa of the humerus bone. When we play the video, we can see the ulna from a medial view. And when we look at the ulna bone from a medial view, we can identify that this is the olecranon process, which will articulate with the olecranon fossa of the humerus. We have this U of the ulna. The U of the ulna will articulate with the trochlea of the humerus bone. And that's why this U is called trochlear notch of the ulna.
this part right here of the ulna bone is called coronoid process. And the coronoid process of the ulna articulates with the coronoid fossa of the humerus when we flex at the elbow. So we bring the forearm closer to the arm. And I will show you a video with a flexion movement soon. If we go ahead and we keep looking at this image, we can stop in the anterior view and we can see right here the coronoid process of the ulna that when we flex, we'll go into this fossa right here of the humerus bone, which is called coronoid fossa. So remember we mentioned the trochlea of the humerus. This is the trochlea of the humerus. The trochlea of the humerus will articulate with the trochlear notch of the ulna, which is the inside of the U of ulna. When we look at the radius bone, we see here the head of the radius bone. And the head of the radius articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. So this is the capitulum of the humerus. Remember, you capture the signal for the radio to work. You tune in. So this is the capitulum articulating with the head of the radius. Now, when we bring the forearm closer to the arm because we are flexing, the same way that the coronoid process of the ulna goes into the coronoid fossa of the humerus, the radius head, the head of the radius, goes into the radial fossa of the humerus. And again, I will show you a video with that happening soon. Now, can you notice that the radius head articulates with the ulna bone right there? And since this part of the ulna bone is touched by the head of the radius. This part of the ulna bone is called radial notch of the ulna. It is a notch in the ulna bone that receives the head of the radius. Also looking at this view, we can see very well that we have a rough spot in the ulna bone. And this rough spot is a tuberosity. Since this is a tuberosity in the ulna bone, we call this ulnar tuberosity. Now, when we look in this view, we can see that the radius bone has a rough spot right there. And obviously, if it is a rough spot, is a tuberosity. If it is a tuberosity in the radius bone, this is called radial tuberosity. The radial tuberosity is very important because it is the point of attachment for the biceps brachii muscle. And let's take a look at that right now. In this video, we are seeing the biceps brachii muscle. We see that it attaches at the radial tuberosity of the radius bone right there. And this movement that brings the forearm closer to the arm is flexion. And when we take the forearm away from the arm, that's extension. So this is flexion, and now we have extension. Flexion and extension. Now let's take a look at how the bones are articulating when we have our forearm in a flexed position. Now, obviously, you guys will need to imagine that we do not have all this connective tissue right here between the bones, which are there to show how it really is, because we need all this connective tissue to stabilize the joint. Now, we are just learning at this moment the bones and bone features, so that's what we'll be focusing right now. And keeping that in mind, we can see that every time we flex our forearm, we have the coronoid process of the ulna bone going into the coronoid fossa of the humerus bone. And the head of the radius bone goes into the radial fossa of the humerus bone. Now, observe that the inside of the U for ulna which is the trochlea, independently of us flexing the forearm or extending the forearm, which is the opposite movement of flexion, this trochlea notch of the ulna is always articulating with the trochlea of the humerus bone. And also the head of the radius is always articulating with the capitulum of the humerus bone. Now, when we are flexing, this is the olecranon, remember? When we are flexing, the olecranon is not into the olecranon fossa because we 
removed the olecranon process from there, and we brought the coronoid process and the radius head close to the coronoid fossa of the humerus and to the radial fossa of the humerus, respectively. Now, there is one more thing I would like you guys to notice, and it is this tandem right here. This is the tandem of the long head of the biceps brachii, and this tandem is going through the intertubercular groove or bicepital groove of the humerus bone. Now we are more than ready to look at the two bones we have in our forearm, the ulna bone and the radius bone. Remember, everything is in relationship to the anatomical position. In anatomical position, the palms of our hands are facing anteriorly. Consequently, the thumb is always lateral. You remember the radius bone is always lateral because the thumb is the antenna for the radio. As a consequence, if the radius bone is always lateral, the ulna bone must be medial. When we look at these images, we see the olecranon process right here. And you remember, oh, I hit my olecranon. Consequently, you hit your elbow. And if you remember that, you can conclude that this is the posterior view of these bones. And this will be then the anterior view. If you know that the radius bone is always lateral and that this is the anterior view, you can conclude that we are looking at the left on a bone and the left radius bone. Now, let's look at the proximal end of the ulna bone. Besides the olecranon process that we can see better in the posterior view, and we barely can see the olecranon process right there, but we can see it's not as big as in the posterior view. We have also in the proximal end of the ulna bone, the trochlear notch, which is the inside of the U. And also we have the coronoid process, which is the other end of the U. Some students like to remember this sequence by remembering OTC, over-the-counter medication, so you have the olecranon process, the trochlear notch, and the coronoid process of the ulna bone. If we keep looking at the ulna bone, but now we move to the distal end of the ulna, we see that the ulna has a pointy process right there that we see in the anterior view and also in the posterior view, and this pointy process is conveniently named the styloid process of the ulna. When we look at the radius bone, we also see a styloid process. And the styloid process of the radius, together with the styloid process of the ulna, are the little bumps we feel in the lateral and medial aspect of our wrist. Obviously, the little bump we feel in the medial aspect of our wrist is the styloid process of the ulna bone, and the little bump we feel in the lateral aspect of our wrist is the styloid process of the radius bone. Now, let's go and look at the proximal end of the radius. In the proximal end of the radius, we find the head of the radius right here. And obviously, underneath the head, we will have the neck of the radius, because underneath the head, you have a neck. Also, in the proximal end of the radius, we see the radial tuberosity, which is the point of attachment for the biceps brachii muscle. Another thing we see is that between the radius bone and the ulna bone, we have this interosseous membrane, which is a fibrous connective tissue that joins these two bones together. And we'll talk more about it when we go over the different types of joints in the joints chapter. Now, I would like you guys to pay attention to a very important detail. We just saw the head of the radius right here, and the head of the radius, as you can see, is in the proximal end of the radius. Now, the ulna bone also has a head. The only thing is that the ulna bone head is in the distal end of the ulna, and you'll find the head of the ulna always lateral to the styloid process of the ulna. And since the head of the ulna is always lateral to the styloid process of the ulna, the head of the ulna will be always facing the radius bone, which is the bone that's always lateral to the ulna. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Now, this particular spot in the radius bone that receives the head of the ulna is a notch. And since this notch in the radius bone receives the head of the ulna, this notch in the radius bone is called ulnar notch of the radius. It is a notch in the radius bone that receives the head of the ulna. 
The same way we have a notch in the radius bone that receives the head of the ulna, we have a notch in the ulna bone that receives the head of the radius. But that is in the proximal end, because the head of the radius is in the proximal end of the radius bone. So when we look at the proximal end of the ulna, we will find a notch that receives the head of the radius. And obviously, that notch in the ulna bone that receives the head of the radius bone is called radial notch of the ulna. Now, these spots that these two bones are joining together are joints. And there is a joint in the proximal end, and there is another joint in the distal end. And both of these joints are between the radius bone and the ulna bone. Consequently, these joints are named radial ulnar joints. Now, the joint that is in the proximal end is called proximal radial ulnar joint. And the proximal radial ulnar joint is specifically the head of the radius articulating with the radial notch of the ulna. And in the distal end, we have the distal radial ulnar joint, which is specifically the head of the ulna articulating with the ulnar notch of the radius. And these proximal and distal radial ulnar joints are the joints that allow us to pronate and supinate our forearm. And that is exactly what you're seeing in this video. This is the proximal radial ulnar joint right here. And this is the distal radial ulnar joint. The proximal radial ulnar joint is formed by the head of the radius bone articulating with the radial notch of the ulna. The distal radial ulnar joint is formed by the head of the ulna bone articulating with the ulnar notch of the radius. And if the head of the ulna is right here making up the distal radial ulnar joint, you can easily remember that the head of the ulna is in the distal end of the ulna. And the ulna bone, together with the metacarpal bones, which are the bones that make up the palms of our hands, and the phalanges, which are the bones that make up our fingers and thumb, are the only bones in our body that have the head in the distal end. All the other bones in our body have the head in the proximal end. So that's something very particular about phalanges, metacarpals, and ulna bones. We also see in this image the little bumps on the lateral and medial aspect of our wrist, which are the styloid process of the radius bone and the styloid process of the ulna bone. Now, pay attention that every time our forearm is pronated, the radius bone is anterior to the ulna bone. And this only happens because of the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. Also, as part of our upper limbs, we have our hands. And in our hands, we have carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Carpals are the bones that make up our wrist. And we have eight carpal bones. And they are all short bones. When we look at the metacarpals, we have five of them. And they are the bones that make up the palms of our hands. And metacarpals are long bones, as well as the phalanges. All phalanges are long bones because they are longer than wider. Remember that? Now, we have several phalanges. We have a total of 14 phalanges, actually. Let's start by looking at the carpal bones. We have two rows of carpal bones making up our wrist. And I strongly advise you to remember them in order by using a mnemonic. The mnemonic I like is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Scaphoid, lunate, trichatrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. The trapezium is always under the thumb. Trapezium under the thumb. The trichatrum is right before the pisiform. Because if you drink lots of rum, you pee a lot. So you have trichatrum and pisiform. The capitate is right underneath your middle finger. Because if you stick your middle finger up, I will decapitate you. And you are set. 
These are the order of the carpal bones when we look in the anterior view. If you follow the same order, you can see here in the posterior view, but then you need to start from right to left. So you have scaphoid, lunate, trichatrum, pisiform cannot be seen very well in the posterior view. You have trapezium always under the thumb. Then you have trapezoid, capitate underneath the middle finger and hamate. When we look at the metacarpals, we have metacarpals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And we always start counting in the thumb. So metacarpal 1 is always found in the thumb side and metacarpal 5 is always found in the pinky side. After the metacarpals, we have our fingers and the bones we have in our fingers are the phalanges. And the singular for phalanges is phalanx. So when we look at our thumb, which in anatomy is referred as pollex, we see that our thumb has two phalanges. We have the distal phalanx, which is distally located in relationship to the proximal phalanx. If we look at all other fingers, we have the distal phalanx, the proximal phalanx, and in between we have the middle phalanx. Do you need to memorize that your thumb just has two phalanges, the distal and proximal, and all other fingers have distal, middle, and proximal phalanges? No, you do not need to memorize because you look at your hand and you see that your thumb folds once and all your other fingers fold two times. And if they fold two times, it's because you have a joint between the distal and middle phalanx and another joint between the middle phalanx and the proximal phalanx. So obviously, in the index, middle, ring finger, and little finger, you have three phalanges. And your thumb only has two, the distal and proximal phalanges. Now that we covered all the bones in our upper limb, we can look at the bones that attach our upper limb to the axial skeleton. And these bones that attach our upper limb to the axial skeleton are referred together as the pectoral girdle or sometimes also called shoulder girdle. Obviously, they are called shoulder girdle because they are the bones that we find in our shoulder. And the bones are the scapula and clavicle. So, if we look in this diagram right here, we can see both of them, the clavicle and the scapula. The clavicle is anterior and we can literally palpate the entire length of our clavicle. The scapula is posterior. So, let's look at the clavicle first. The clavicle is commonly known as the collarbone. But since this is an anatomy class, you need to know the anatomical name. And the anatomical name is clavicle. The clavicle has this S shape. And the first thing you can see is that the clavicle is longer than wider. Consequently, the clavicle is a long bone. Now, the clavicle is divided into three main regions. We have the medial end of the clavicle. We have the lateral end of the clavicle, and we have the shaft of the clavicle. Obviously, the medial end of the clavicle goes toward the medial aspect of our body. And if you look right here, this is the medial end of the clavicle. Here we have the midline of our body, and this is the sternum, specifically the manubrium of the sternum. So the clavicle bone articulates with the sternum. And obviously, this end of the clavicle that articulates with the sternum was conveniently named sternal end. And can you guess what would be the name of the joint between the sternum and the clavicle? Yes, you can. The joint is named sternoclavicular joint. When we look at the lateral end of the clavicle, we see that it articulates with a specific process of the scapula, which is named a chromium process. And since this lateral end of the clavicle articulates with the chromium process of the scapula, the lateral end of the clavicle was named a chromial end. So it all makes sense. And if you go ahead and you touch the bony tip of your shoulder, you're literally touching the acromion process of the scapula, and if you move a little bit anterior, you can feel the joint between the acromion end of the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula, which is named 
acromioclavicular joint. And when we look at this acromioclavicular joint from a posterior view, like we are seeing in this picture, we see that the clavicle, specifically the acromial end of the clavicle, articulates with the acromion process of the scapula, which is this bone. The scapula is the bone that is commonly known as the shoulder blade. You can see that the scapula is very flat, and as such, the scapula is a flat bone. The scapula has this triangular shape, and in the posterior, superior aspect of the scapula, we can even feel in our back this ridge that we call a spine of the scapula. And if you follow this ridge laterally, you end up in the acromion, also called the acromion process of the scapula. Now, using the spine as a reference, we see that we have a depression inferior to the spine and we have a depression superior to the spine. And a depression is called a fossa. And a depression found inferior to the spine it is conveniently named infraspinous fossa, and a depression superior to the spine is conveniently named supraspinous fossa. Now, if we look at the anterior view of the scapula, which is the view that we are seeing in this image right here, and that we do not have a spine, we have a fossa, but this fossa will not have the root spinous in its name. And that's one way you can remember that the anterior aspect of the scapula has the subscapular fossa. If we look at the superior aspect of the scapula right here, we have a notch. We can also see the same notch in this picture that you find in your terminology list. And since this notch is in the superior aspect of the scapula, it is named suprascapular notch. Now I would like you to look at this bone right here. Can you tell me which bone is this one? This is the humerus bone. The humerus is the only bone in our arm. And the head of the humerus articulates with the scapula. And that's how our upper limb is connected to the pectoral girdle. And the head of the humerus articulates specifically with the glenoid cavity, also called glenoid fossa of the scapula. And since the glenoid fossa articulates with the head of the humerus, you can conclude that the glenoid fossa is always facing laterally. So the head of the humerus can articulate with it, right? And when we look at the scapula from a lateral view, we can see very well the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity, which articulates with the head of the humerus. And when bones join together, we have a joint. And since this is a joint between the glenoid fossa of the scapula and the head of the humerus, this joint is called glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is our shoulder joint. Also, in this lateral view of the scapula, we see another process very well. And this process is named coracoid process of the scapula. Now, students love confusing coracoid process of the scapula with coronoid process of the ulna. The way I suggest you to remember that this is the coracoid process is by remembering that attaching to the coracoid process of the scapula, we have the coracobrachialis muscle, which is a muscle that looks like a cobra. And you'll see that muscle specifically in the lab. So if you remember, and you'll be able to see in the lab that the coracobrachialis muscle attached at the coracoid process of the scapula, we will never confuse the words coracoid with coronoid. Also, in this lateral view of the scapula, we see the acromion or acromion process of the scapula that we talked before. And if we look in this picture right here, we see the acromion process as well that articulates with the acromion end of the clavicle. And if we go to the medial end of the clavicle, we see that we have the external end. Guys, the external end of the clavicle forms the sternoclavicular joint. And the sternoclavicular joint is the only bony articulation between the pectoral girdle and the axial skeleton. So now, if you go ahead 
and you put your hand over your clavicle and you move your shoulder around, you can really feel that even though your humerus is not directly articulating with the clavicle, we have the clavicle and the scapula moving as a unit because the clavicle is the only bone that's attaching to the axial skeleton. And the clavicle is also the same bone that's attaching to the scapula, which is articulating with the humerus. And this single point of attachment of the pectoral girdle with the axial skeleton allows us to have an extensive mobility in the shoulder joint, which obviously allows us to have great mobility with our upper limbs. And with this, we finish this lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in class. Bye!